Uh, now, without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker, uh, an amazing keynote presentation from my friend Chon Siak Ching, the CEO of the National Gallery of Singapore. Please, round of applause for her. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I would like to thank the uh, organizer for giving me this opportunity uh, to be able to share with you how cultural institutions like uh, National Gallery of Singapore navigate in a world of uh, disruption uh, and through, through art. Uh, in such a world, we see the threats but also the opportunities uh, for cultural innovations to be unleashed, for culture to, to thrive, to stay relevant, uh, to empower citizens, create value, and to basically embrace everyone. But first, let me start with an introduction of National Gallery Singapore. Can I just have a show of hands? How many of you have been to the National Gallery? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your support, and I hope you will uh, keep coming uh, back. Well, at the National Gallery, we, we believe uh, that the power uh, of art, and that art has the power to transform uh, people, and, uh, and also to transform uh, societies. So we want to ensure that uh, as part of our uh, mission, uh, we look at different ways to foster and to inspire um, a thoughtful, creative and inclusive society. And how do we do that? Uh, we focus on Southeast Asian art, so we look at how to create dialogues between the art of uh, Singapore, Southeast Asia and uh, the world through collaborative research, education and exhibitions. And the gallery just opened in November 2015, so we're just two and a half years old. A young institution uh, in a fairly young nation, and uh, which we all know is just going to celebrate uh, its 53rd birthday this year. But cities and nations have to plan quite far ahead. But at the same time, their growth, planned or otherwise, is often disrupted by changes in technology, by changes in you know, labour, uh, consumer uh, demands. And the case in point is Bilbao in Spain. From a thriving port city in the uh, 60s, early 60s, to a major industrial uh, town in the 80s, it started to see severe decline in jobs uh, and de because of deindustrialization in the 90s. So innovative solutions have to be found uh, to address challenges like this to stay relevant and, and to survive. In fact, culture came in as a cure uh, and came in to rescue that declining uh, city. The development of Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao in 1997 had turned around uh, the city and is now a vibrant destination for arts uh, and for uh, culture. So this was the first uh, disruption of the traditional museum model uh, which, as I mentioned, was used as a cure uh, to address the disruption in the economy. Well, on the other hand, the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi is currently facing a lot of challenges trying to get itself off the ground. And one could say that, well, an institution uh, with an American name, well, from an American uh, city, Jewish name, uh, in a Middle Eastern country, in a very prominent location at such a big scale during challenging economic times will be quite hard put uh, to, to kind of be launched uh, and to be embraced by the local citizens. But uh, Guggenheim Foundation continues to believe in the transformative potential of this particular project as a catalyst for exchange and for expanding the narratives uh, of art history. So while the benefits of uh, global cultural exchange just are evident, I think the timing, the potential downside from the scale, the association uh, has to be contended with. But the other museum in Abu Dhabi had 
successfully launched too much fanfare. Um, and uh, that is the Louvre Abu Dhabi. By sharing art, uh, making new histories together, uh, museums can be cultural diplomats, uh, extending the soft power to build uh, enduring relationships. Uh, but this particular innovation has also its share of controversy. Because of its name, the Louvre, coming from France, its very rich collection, using its strong brand name and its management expertise to be financially compensated for their involvement, had also drawn criticism that museums should not be for sale. So again, a case of how does one navigate such boundary issues when trying to do good. And without question, uh, culture, the way culture is being consumed today uh, has changed. The way it is being taught, conceived, presented, I think has gone through a lot of rapid changes. And this therefore requires cultural institutions like ourselves to also innovate, to keep pace with the change. And we all know the internet revolution uh, is the industrial revolution of our times. And with it uh, came the digital revolution. And that has disrupted everything we know from businesses to governments to even ourselves, the way we live our lives. Cultural institutions are not spared either. Well, we know cryptocurrency has disrupted uh, traditional banks, uh, ride-sharing apps like Uber, Grab, they've disrupted the traditional taxi system. So how do cultural institutions deal with this disruption? And someone recently asked me, in this uh, asset light world. Is it feasible that a museum not own its collection, just like Airbnb does not own any of its uh, hotel rooms? And um, that might seem a little bit hard to imagine for museums that have been from the very start so proud of the collection it owns. But we are already seeing ways of museums presenting uh, themselves, not in a physical space, but in a virtual space. And I, I think we have to continue to be able to disrupt our own conventional mode of thinking in this world. And art, in fact, has always been disrupting itself. If you look at this particular piece of work by uh, Marcel, Marcel Duchamp, when he first presented a urinal as an art object, it created an uproar in the art world. But this particular work in 1917 continues to be cited today as a turning point and a force of change in the course of art history. And subsequent artists like him has kept disrupting the art history development with new movements. So it is therefore not surprising with such bold statements uh, by artists like Duchamp for modern art to be often questioned. Uh, and especially with this environment of you know, scrutiny, digital disruption, art has become democratized in a modern art museum. What, you know, what is art? Uh, and this is what Google search will tell you, it's garbage, it's not art, it's trash. And this is what we have to also contend with. So let me share a little bit of how we deal with issues like this. Leveraging on technology, of course, wherever we can. So we start by trying to really go deep in terms of understanding our customers. We undertook a research we call our a KOV research on Know Our Visitor. Um, and it has, through that research, revealed very interesting profiles of museum goers um, who are not segmentized by demographics, but in fact by their motivations to visit. And it allows us to therefore, therefore better understand our audiences uh, in terms of what they are looking for when they visit, what motivates them to come, and allow us to then integrate the visitor into uh, the museum experience from the very beginning of their journey, which actually starts before they even start and step into the gallery. And we found that there are different uh, so-called uh, profiles by motivations. 
And let me just share with you as we deep dive into one of them, which we call the communitas. This is the segment that looks towards connecting with their wider uh, community uh, to connect with people, like-minded people like themselves. And uh, with this kind of a key motivation, and you, we find that it cuts across different age groups. So it is no longer just pure demographics that drives uh, visitor uh, understanding. We will be able to then customize or prepare and program our offerings that are more suited to groups like this. And knowing our visitor extends beyond, uh, extends into mapping their journey uh, at the museum to know what resonates with them, how long they stay in each space or stare at each painting, uh, the potential choke points along the way in the museum, and all with a view of really understanding what their likes are, what their dislikes are, and also ensuring that their visit can be designed to uh, be memorable and that they will return. And of course, we have to be smart about how we pursue these innovations in confronting the digital and the new realities, uh, not accepting the status quo, even though sometimes you know, we have to step out of the comfort zone to disrupt what already works well today. It will help us, I think, to kind of keep ourselves relevant. And therefore, we've crafted a, a smart museum framework for us to look at how do we imaginatively harness the power of uh, digital technology to empower artists as well as uh, museum professionals to engage and inspire connections between the art and the public and to also cultivate uh, a community that uh, is inclusive, that's creative and thoughtful. And our focus is uh, on three things, unleashing art with you know, hopefully without you know, uh, creating museum even without walls, empowering our citizens and also disrupting work, leveraging on uh, uh, artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning. And I'll just go through a few examples. So one example of leveraging digital to uh, unleash art is an exhibition or not an exhibition as we call it, uh, Unrealized, where when you walk within the gallery spaces, some space will activate uh, this particular uh, exhibition and uh, you'll be able to then access customized content which we had worked with artists like Ho Zun Yen, Erika uh, Tan and Heeman Chong. And you will then see site-specific art in its digital form. So this will cater to audience groups that like to be surprised and immerse themselves in uh, new experiences. Where art cannot be brought to the museum in its physical form, like this huge painting called Spolarium, it's uh, actually a national treasure of the Philippines, huge 4.4 by 7.6 meters. We then transported the audience to the art in its virtual form, but in a manner that allows the visitor to engage with the art um, that a physical experience will not permit. For example, zooming in to get more information or getting into the details of the art even closer than what a normal human eye can see and layering over it with additional information from uh, the curators. And this particular uh, virtual piece of work was presented during our recent Century of Light uh, exhibition. So machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence is also disrupting uh, our workforce. So why not make good use of it? So we have uh, come up with a chatbot uh, for our exhibitions and this complements the work that our gallery hosts are already doing, but they're doing so many things. They are looking after the safety of the artwork, they're looking after the safety of the visitor, and they're also trying to engage our visitors with information about the art. But now there's a chatbot that can help to relieve them of one uh, of their tasks. 
We also have another uh, AI colleague called Evie, and Evie is everyone's personal assistant. She helps us to schedule meetings, she helps us to book meeting rooms, and uh, the way she interacts with everyone is you almost feel like you're talking to a real person. And we've also uh, adopted an AI uh, salesware, which helps our venue rental team to see through, to talk to many, many customers virtually before we ultimately have a face-to-face -face meeting. So between reaching out to 835 uh, potential customers and all the way down to 49 that is shortlisted for our team to meet face-to-face, -face, it was an AI colleague at work. And just to share with you one of our work in progress, uh, this is done by our in-house uh, innovation team right now together with our innovation partner Accenture. Uh, we are working at letting users see artworks in everyday objects and in fact, you may not know this, but perhaps right now in your pocket, you own something that comprises uh, two pieces of uh, art that is hanging at the gallery. Uh, if you take out your $50 note, you'll see what I mean. And we are uh, working on something that allows you to see the real painting when you put up, uh, you know, when you look at the $50 uh, note. Well, all these innovations and smart initiatives will not be possible with, I guess, smart people. And um, we are very lucky at the gallery, smart and passionate people. We are very lucky at the gallery to have a very diverse group of people who are very passionate about what they do. And the diversity that also matches the diversity of our audiences helps us to keep you know, innovating to meet the requirements, the needs of our audiences. And as we pursue innovation, uh, we must also not lose focus on the end outcome of what we are trying to achieve. Why are we doing all this? Is it just for the novelty? Or really, is it for us to increase audience engagement, higher efficiency, or for a bigger order uh, thing? Um, and we, we always remind ourselves that our raison d'etre is really to true cultural experiences to help us better navigate a world of disruption and bring about a better world. And Tim Jones, if I may cite him in his uh, uh, presentation on why cities need cultural disruption, talks about how do we use cultural differences to build social cohesion? How do we leverage culture to transform uh, impoverished places into vibrant, resilient economies? And I've cited some examples in Bilbao, Guggenheim, and in Abu Dhabi. So coming back full circle into, in terms of the gallery's why when we pursue innovation, it is really about building a thoughtful, creative and inclusive society. And we believe that both culture and innovation go hand in hand in enabling the gallery to be a force for good, a force for good for society. So this brings me to the end of my presentation and I wish you all a very good rest of the day. Thank you.